So we have this pressure within, this sinful desire within, and we have a world without. Both of them are applying pressure to our convictions. And if our convictions are not stronger than the pressure, the pressure is what wins. But I'm going to give you one more chance, says Nebuchadnezzar. When you hear the music, that's your cue. When you hear the music, bow down to that God, the image right over there, the image that I have made. If you do so, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately, again, the furnace is ready and burning. You shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? That sentence right there is highly emphatic. We might translate it, who in the world could be such a God that would deliver you from this? Verse 18, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. In other words, we don't need to explain ourselves. We don't need to defend ourselves in this matter, O king. We don't need to tell you our reasonings. We're just going to tell you that we are not going to bow down to your gods. We have no need to answer you in this matter, verse 17. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and He will deliver us out of your hand, O King. But if not, be it known to you, O King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So that's a little bit of a confusing phrase right there. We know He will deliver us. We know He's able to deliver us. We know He's going to deliver us. But if He doesn't deliver us, then we're still not going to worship your God. It's a little bit confusing. And I think the point here is this. The point is, Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishaiah, they understand the point of the book. The point of the book, again, is God delivers His people ultimately. Often He delivers them in earthly ways, but ultimately He is guaranteed to deliver His people ultimately. So they say... We will be delivered from your hand, King Nebuchadnezzar. In other words, your fiery furnace will not burn up our soul. Because we know the God who has the power not only to kill the body, but to throw one in hell afterwards. We know Him and we know He will deliver us from your hand. You might burn us in the furnace. He might deliver us out of the furnace or He might not. Either way, we will be delivered to Him. In fact, your furnace is going to accelerate His deliverance of us. So they express this faith, and the faith that they express, this is really important to see, the faith that they express is a faith not in God's deliverance, but in God. The difference there is really crucial to see. They don't have faith that God will deliver them. They have faith in God. Or to put it another way, they don't have faith in God's blessing. They have faith in God. That is a very crucial, helpful, and important difference to grasp. That our faith must be grounded and rooted upon God, not what He might or might not do in this life. When God's blessings dry up, He's just as good. When God's deliverance doesn't come, He's just as good. When God delivers us over to the trial Himself, He's just as good. This is a hard thing to learn that I'm still working on for decades now, to learn the truth that I cannot measure God's love by my circumstances. Because in my circumstances, God is doing all kinds of things. He might be blessing me in circumstances. He might be teaching me in circumstances. He might be disciplining me in circumstances. Plus, He might be using my circumstances in the lives of others. In fact, He is using my circumstances in the lives of others. So you see how futile it is for me to gauge God's love by my circumstances. But that is a hard thing to learn. Because the human heart wants to just automatically go right back to viewing God's love for you or viewing His goodness in terms of your circumstances, we must teach our hearts diligently. Our circumstances cannot be a measurement of God's goodness or God's love. 
the only thing that is an accurate measurement of God's goodness and God's love is the cross. That is the only thing that we can always infallibly look to and say, this is the measure of God's love. In that He sent forth His Son to die for us. You know the New Testament never mentions God's love without mentioning the cross. Did you know that? Nowhere in the New Testament does it reference God's love for His people without, in the same context, mentioning the cross. Because that is the measurement of God's love for His people. So they express this faith, this, this faith that God may deliver us from this or He may not. But we will nevertheless not bow down to you. The parallels again just continue to be stunning. You can have all of this. All you got to do is bow down. Just bow down. You will avoid the fiery furnace. Just bow down to this one God. Just, just celebrate this God. If I use that word, doesn't it sound really 21st century? Just celebrate this God with us. That's all you got to do. Our society today, we are absolutely given over to the idea of celebrating the false God of today. And if you aren't prepared to celebrate that false God, then you will be prepared to be given over to the fiery furnace of society because that's where you're going in our society today. I wanted to illustrate this just to kind of bring home just how prevalent this is in our society today. And literally, we're swimming in it. There are hundreds of examples, hundreds of articles I could have pulled up to just give an example of what I'm talking about in the sense that if you are prepared to celebrate the God of this age, then we will give you everything. If not, we will take from you everything. So many places I could have illustrated it, but there was one that I kind of landed on. Happened two weeks ago. We all know what month we're in, right? We have it shoved down our throat all day long, every day, what month we're in. Well, just a couple of years ago, June was, you would sort of hear about Pride Month and there might be a parade here or there. Now it is shoved down your throat everywhere you turn what this month is all about. Part of that is that if you go to an event this month, whether it be a sporting event or a musical event or whatnot, virtually every event now is renamed, recategorized as some type of Pride event. Pride night, pride concert, pride this, pride that. Okay, So a couple weeks ago, the Tampa Bay Rays, Major League Baseball team, of course they had the obligatory pride night. And for this, they wore alternate uniforms. Uniforms that just had the rainbow on a sleeve and, and a rainbow image on the hat. And praise God, nearly half the team opted not to wear the uniform knowing the same thing that you know, which is the entire weight of society was going to come down upon them. And so very wisely, they saw that that's what was going to happen, and so they, they didn't just sort of stumble into it. They prepared for it. They, they appointed one among them to be the spokesperson for the group so that you weren't getting 14 different stories and the media was twisting this. and compare. They appointed one person to speak for them for why they chose not to, to wear for this particular game the rainbow on the sleeve and the rainbow on the hat and all this sort of thing. And so the one they pointed was a picture by the name of Jason Adam. And so here's, let me read some of the, some of his statement and how he explained and just notice the tact, notice the care, notice, notice the, the precision of his language, how he's so careful not to make it anything more than it had to be. Listen to this. He said he made clear that their decision was a decision that was based uh, on their faith and their Christian conviction. He said that a lot of it comes down to faith, a faith-based decision. It's a hard decision because ultimately we all said that we want them to know that they are all welcomed and loved here. But when we put it on our bodies, I think a lot of guys decided it's just a lifestyle that maybe that they just don't look down on anybody or think differently, but it's just maybe we don't want to encourage it if we believe in Jesus who encouraged us to live a lifestyle that would abstain from the behavior, just like Jesus encourages me as a heterosexual male to abstain from sex outside the confines of marriage. It's no different. 
He went on to, to, he went on trying to say, it's not judgmental. It's not looking down. It's just what we believe the lifestyle that it's, he's encouraged us to live. It's for our good, not to withhold. But again, we love those men and women. We care about them and we want them to feel safe and welcomed here. We love them. We have nothing against them. We're glad they're here. We hope they come more. We just can't promote it on our bodies. That's what he, what he went on to say. We cannot put on our bodies an advertisement for something we believe to be morally wrong based upon our Christian conviction. So you notice just the care that he took with this. Kind of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's no indication in the text that they were telling other people not to bow. I mean, I'm sure that they would have thought in their hearts, you know, I wish that they weren't bowing to this. But there's no indication that they're saying, get up! That's wrong. You can't do this. They simply said, we can't. Yet that was enough. Because the kingdom of evil will allow no dissenters. The kingdom of evil will allow no dissenters. All must celebrate their false god. So, as you know what was coming, the media just came down upon them like a ton of bricks. Articles started to come out. An attempt at inclusion proves there's more work to do. The New York Times says that it was a big fail. Because Get this. Because the team allowed these players to get by by not making a positive affirmation of the LGBTQIA. Yet they allowed the players to opt out of the promotion and use a platform to, uh, to endorse an opposing view, therefore the rays undercut their whole message of inclusion. Did you hear that? It was a failure because you allowed some of them to opt out of it. I hope you're seeing the parallels between Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who just simply said, we can't worship and celebrate that. that that's not a god. That's metal and wood and bricks. There's a living God and we're His people. And so you bow down. And we're not saying anything against you. You bow down. You do your thing. But when it comes to this, we cannot. The kingdom of evil will allow no dissenters. All, all must be on board. Now, as they stood there and did not bow, I wonder what the effect was for those who were watching. In my mind, I just imagined the scenario. I like to picture them at the front. Maybe they were in the back. But I like to picture them in the front. So maybe they're in the front. And as I said before, it's almost certain that they were not the only Jews who were put into the court of the king Nebuchadnezzar. And so it's almost certain that they're not the only Jews that were there. They were the only ones who weren't bowing. So imagine the effect for the other young Jewish men. Their faces one inch from the ground and they look up and they see... Azariah. There's Hananiah too. Mishaiah. They're not bowing. Why don't they bow? Don't they know? It's the furnace. I've known Hananiah my whole life. They're going to throw him in the furnace. Why why doesn't he just bow? All he's got to do is just bow. He doesn't even have to mean it. He just has to get down. We all know that's just a statue, but we're doing it. We're going to live. Why doesn't Hananiah do it? But then the effect afterwards, after they save their skin, now we know that they're going to, of course, skip out of the furnace, even if they died. Maybe even more so if they'd been burned in the furnace. What would that effect have been? I think it was a dramatic effect on those who were looking on. And one of the reasons I think that is because of a heritage of faith in the living God that we're going to see some 600 years later. Remember the story in Matthew chapter 1? When those who show up to worship the Christ child, we are told are wise men from the east that studied the stars. They would have been Persians who would have been closely connected, almost the descendants of the Babylonians. There would have been a close connection with these wise men 
and the Babylonians from six centuries prior. So I think there was a seed of belief, a seed of faith that existed there among the Chaldeans that was planted there by Daniel, by his friends, and they saw them stand and they wouldn't bow. And that gave rise to what centuries later would be these wise men showing up to worship the Christ child. The Christ child for whom it is worth standing up to false gods for. Or think about young Saul. Remember young Saul watching Stephen? Who himself wouldn't bow before the gods of his day. And then young Saul watches the rocks bounce off his head. Years later, after his conversion, certainly he would remember Stephen. Certainly he would remember the stand that Stephen took. And certainly that had a great impact upon Saul. But Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they must make their decision quickly, and they wisely do. So they answer, but if not be it known to you, king, we would not serve your God. So the idea here, there were, they weren't given time. Like before, they were given overnight to think about this and pray over this. They were given no time. They had to make their decision right then and right there, and they did it, and that was a good thing. I think God providentially set it up so that they didn't have time to think about this. Imagine if they had had a day. Think it over, Hananiah. Azariah, y'all come back tomorrow. Be prepared to bow tomorrow. Think about this tonight. What would have come into their minds? It's just one bow. Just one bow. Maybe I could just sort of halfway bow. And it's, it's not real. I know it's not real. Now, I know the New Testament's not written yet, but our New Testaments tell us that food offered to an idol, and if you know in your heart that that idol is nothing, then eating that food is nothing. So I know that that statue is nothing. It means nothing for me to get down on the ground before, because I know the living God. I will say, and how much more useful am I to God's kingdom alive? God has delivered me through the, the... The food test. He's delivered me through the dream thing. Certainly He doesn't want me to die in a furnace now. I can do so much more for God. Or maybe they would have thought like this. You know, my entire family was killed in Jerusalem. I am the last of my family. If I die in a furnace, what good is that? My family is over. All the things that would have come into their mind. But God graciously didn't give them. They had to answer right then, right there. They already knew their answer. They knew this was coming. This didn't surprise. They weren't blindsided by this. They knew that the day would come when they would either have to bow to the false gods of Babylon or stand. They didn't know when or exactly how, but that statue was unveiled and they said, this is it. We know what we're going to do. And they didn't have time to reconsider it. They made their decision. Sometimes, in God's grace, He doesn't give us the time to mull things over. Because oftentimes when we do mull things over, well, that just opens up a door, doesn't it? But they face this decision, this moral dilemma, this this choice that they have to make. This same type of choice that all of us have to make. And here's how they make the choice. The choice is made by two forces within them. There are two forces in your life. The stronger of those two forces determine your moral choices. You know what those forces are? One of the forces is pressure. Pressure from the world and pressure from your sinful heart. The other force is your convictions. Those are the two forces. It's as simple as that. The stronger of the two determine what your choices will be. If pressure is stronger than convictions, pressure carries the day. If convictions are stronger than pressure, convictions carry the day. Now the Bible tells us this. The Bible tells us how these forces impact upon us. You remember the story of Cain, what God said to Cain after he killed his brother. He says, sin is crouching at the door. You must master it. Or remember the words of James in James chapter 4. What causes quarrels and divisions among you? Is it not that your passions are at war within you? So we have this pressure within, this sinful desire within, and we have a world without. Both of them are applying pressure to our convictions. 
And if our convictions are not stronger than the pressure, the pressure is what wins. This is why we spent so much time in chapter 1 talking about Christian conscience. Because conscience is all that carries them through right now. That's the only reason that they stand and not bow. Because their conscience, remember how we said, is, has been informed by the Scriptures... And it's been restored by the work of the Holy Spirit, illumined by the work of the Holy Spirit, and strengthened by their obedience to the Scriptures. And that has refined their conscience so that their conscience is now working more like it was designed to work. And it's been strengthened, it's been upheld through their obedience. And therefore, this conscience is a stronger force than the pressure that comes against them. And that was a strong pressure. Smoke is a very detectable smell, isn't it? Do you ever stand beside a campfire and not know that you're standing beside a campfire? They're standing there smelling that smoke, feeling that heat. And it's right there. That had to have been um, intense pressure. I've read that one of the most painful ways to die is being burned alive. Intense pressure. Intense. Yet their convictions have been strengthened and their convictions are stronger than the pressure that's coming against them. 